And uh, we have been in a series called Ask for Me in My House, and Baptism Weekend falls right in the middle of this series that we've been talking about, the home and family. And so this is Ask for Me in My House, Baptism Edition. And if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Acts, and to lay some groundwork, uh, if you're new again to church, uh, the Bible is made up of 66 books. It's not a book. It's a library of 66 books broken down into two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us of creation and the fall and, and the law and all the prophecies and the, the foundation that was laid for the coming Messiah, Jesus, to ultimately step into humanity to rescue and redeem the world. And the New Testament begins with what we would refer to as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what do those encompass? The life and the death and the ministry, the teaching, uh, the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. And right after the Gospels, we then come to which book? The book of Acts which is where we find the, the coming and the arrival of the Holy Spirit and, and the birth of the local church. And we see that this, this small ragtag group of believers who are following Jesus begin to take him at his word, moving forward, developing, building, planting the local church and advancing the cause of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the book of Acts captures what the early church was like. It, it tells us about their journey and it tells us about the things that they experienced and what the first century church had to endure also that you and I could be on this side of history where the gospel has jumped oceans and landed on every continent around the world where we now get to worship in a space like this because individuals like that just trusted God. It's an amazing thing. And in the book of Acts, you find uh, that the early church was facing some odds. The early church had some obstacles to overcome and faced a lot of persecution and adversity. And the early church also had some wild characters and key figures that played a role in the story. And one of them's name is Paul, who is infamously known as the Apostle Paul. We would know him as a hero in our faith. But when we are first introduced to Paul, he's, he's nothing like a hero. In fact, he's not an advocate for the faith. He's an adversary to the faith. In fact, if you do not like Christianity and you think church is a bunch of nonsense, you would have a lot in common with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul initially arrives on the scene in the book of Acts, giving the approval of the murder of one of the early disciples. And from there, he gets permission and authority from the governors and the leaders of the day to then go throughout the region, continuing his persecution of the Christians. And what happens as persecution takes place, the Christians begin to scatter all throughout the region. And so Paul gets permission to go track them down. And so Paul is one day in Acts chapter 9, he's heading to a town by the name of Damascus. And you got to check it out. And he's headed to Damascus, and what I love about it is Paul is heading in the wrong direction with the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And what happens? God still gets it right. And we're amazed by how God's ability to still redeem the brokenness and even the poor decisions of our life, heading in the wrong direction with the wrong people for the wrong reasons, and God shows up. In fact, God knocks him off his high horse, and he has such a an illuminating and profound experience that the Bible tells us that Paul was blind for three days. And during those three days, he's in Damascus. And what I love about it is God goes to a man by the name of Ananias, which side note, Ananias is my favorite character in the entire Bible. And he only gets like three to five sentences. Um, but I love Ananias because if there's anyone in the Bible that I feel like I want to be or identify with the most, it's Ananias. It's none of the really impressive heroes. But God comes to Ananias and says, hey, this guy who showed up to kill all of you, this guy who showed up to arrest and persecute all of you, well, he's actually my chosen instrument. And I need you to go and pray for his healing and tell him I'm going to use him in amazing ways. And I have always found that in the ministry, for me, the things that are most fulfilling is getting to pray with individuals and just tap them on the shoulder and remind them, hey, God has a plan for your life and a purpose that may exceed your comprehension. And if you entrust your life into his hands, he may do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. And 
That's what Ananias does. He comes to Paul and he says, hey, God's going to use you in remarkable ways, which is amazing because, again, how long has Paul been in Damascus? Only three days. He shows up breathing murderous threats, and three days later, Ananias goes to him and says, you're God's chosen instrument. I mean, the turnaround time on grace will make religious folks uncomfortable. Right, like if you are one of the early followers of Christ in Damascus and you're like, wait a second, he can't be on our team. He just showed up to take us out. And what happens is in religious spaces, we always want to doubt God's ability to redeem a life. And sometimes we want to make sure we vet people properly and we want to see some spiritual maturity. And we want to see individuals pass the religious litmus test before we welcome them into the family of God. But folks, know this. The entry exam into heaven is not a litmus test. It is a blood test. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I have been set free and redeemed. And our eternity is secured in Christ alone. Amen. And so it is this radical expression of grace. And Paul, from that moment, moves forward. Known as Saul, he then becomes infamously known as Paul. It's an interesting detail all throughout scripture. You find individuals uh, having their names changed and their reputations changed. I love that God does this. He will come to individuals, chances are he'll come to you and say, your entire life you've been known by this. Your entire life you've operated under these labels and under this reputation, but just know I have something in store for you that looks radically different and I can reverse the labels and the reputation and the shame that is upon your life. And so Paul moves forward known as an apostle. He begins to align his efforts with the early disciples and he starts to play his part in advancing the cause of Christ. And what you find, and we've even witnessed this still to this day, is individuals who have a radical encounter with Christ operate with an audacious boldness and a zeal to see other people experience the same. And so Paul, you know, embarks on this journey that says, I'm going to go after the hard assignments. And I'm going to go after individuals who are like me, who are heading in the wrong direction with the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And I'm going to extend to them the good news of the gospel. Which, folks, that is what the word gospel means. It means good news, not good advice. Sometimes we can reduce you know, church and Christianity down to good advice. And no, yes, scripture comes with a great deal of profound wisdom. But God did not just come offering advice. He came offering an adventure. And don't sell yourself short just settling for good advice when the reality is every single one of us has been marked with good news. And what is that good news? That all of humanity, all of history faced the undeniable reality that death was in our future. And every single one of us was at some point going to breathe our last death, meet our maker, and we were all eternally damned. It was the reality for all of us until Jesus shows up and he reverses the curse and he pays the ultimate price on your behalf and on my behalf. And he picks up the tab on a debt we could never pay. And he extends to us life and eternal life and harmony with our creator and our heavenly father. That is good news. But just know good news still attracts uh, some resistance. You ever found that to be the case? You see this in the life of Christ. A life of love still attracts a lot of hate. And Paul is beginning to make his way throughout the region. And as he is proclaiming the goodness of God... Uh, we find that individuals still come against God's work. And there's a point in Acts chapter 16 where Paul is in a city called Philippi. He's there in Philippi with a guy by the name of Silas. And one day they're making their way through the town. And this woman who was enslaved by these corrupt business owners who were exploiting her for profit comes to them. And she is an instigator. Scripture tells us that, you know, she was demon possessed. And she is instigating in the moment and Paul turns around and him and Silas minister to the girl in a way that sets her free, which what happens next? It infuriates her owners. Hey, we've been profiting off this young woman and now you are ruining our business and affecting our wallet. And so they start to attack Paul. And I, what I love about Paul 
is in that moment, it was a calculated decision for Paul. Paul knew, if I do this for her, this is what will happen to me. And that's a true mark of spiritual maturity, an individual who is willing to step out, even take on burden and inconvenience. Also, other people can experience the blessing and the breakthrough and the goodness of our God in and through their life. I wonder what would happen in our lives if if we too operated like a Paul who said, I'm willing to step out and take a hit for other people so they can experience the goodness of our God because our Savior came and took a hit for us and I just feel it's only right to do the same for others. And so Paul is under attack, Silas is under attack and it says in verse 22 of chapter 16, I'm gonna read you guys uh, a few verses here. But it says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, we don't need to overdo it, but you do need to understand that in this moment, Paul and Silas are completely stripped naked in public, and they are not only humiliated, but they are brutally beaten with rods in public. This is a painful and humiliating moment. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So essentially, Paul and Silas, they're they're stripped naked, they're beaten publicly, they're flogged severely, and then they're drugged into prison where essentially they are placed in solitary confinement in the darkest inner cell and their feet are placed in shackles. It's a tough situation. And at about midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword And was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. I love that statement. The jailer called for the lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then then he then brought them out and asked, sirs, and this might be the most important question you ever ask in life. What must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Now, this is amazing. Paul and Silas are in a pretty painful and excruciating situation. How many of us have ever been stripped in public flogged and beaten in public, and then drugged into prison, thrown into solitary confinement and had our hands and feet placed in shackles. Has that ever been your experience? No. Like this is a wild, painful experience. And sometimes what happens is when you go to the pages of scripture, it has a way of leveling our experiences and elevating our perspective. You can't help but look at scripture and think to yourself, it is could be worse. In fact, those maybe are four of the most powerful words you could ever learn to say to yourself. That when you go through life, sure, there's gonna be pain and there's gonna be inconvenience and confusion's gonna come knocking at your door and trials are gonna show up in your life, but it could be worse. And this is where scripture is always extending to us an invitation or it's constantly reminding us that as children of God, We are not called to pattern ourselves after the world, which in our society, in our culture, a victim's mentality has become pervasive. And everyone's walking around, woe is me. And scripture says, no, no, not you. As a child of God, someone who is redeemed by the most high king, you don't walk around with a victim's mentality. You walk around with a victor's mentality. 
Well, what does that mean? How do we apply that? Well, a victim's mentality views your God through the lens of your problems. But a victor's mentality views your problems through the lens of your God. A a victim's mentality says, why is this happening to me? But a victor's mentality, one who is anchored in the truth, one who knows that their God is faithful, one who knows that God is sovereign, who will bring to completion his good work in and through their life, who works all things together for the good of those who trust him. A victor's mentality says, why is this happening for me. My God doesn't waste anything. And in some way, somehow, in a way that I can't plan, in a way that I can't predict, I'm going to look back and recognize this was a blessing in disguise. It could be worse. Someone say that. It could be worse. So when you wake up in the morning, you're sitting at the breakfast table eating the same breakfast you eat every single day for the last 17 years. You think to yourself, it could be worse. And when you jump in that car that's got 200,000 miles on it and you're going down the street and it's making all those different noises and sounds, you just think to yourself, it could be worse. And when you're stuck in traffic, it could be worse. And when you pull into the parking lot of your job and you walk down the hallway past all those annoying employees and you sit in your cubicle and you report to the same old boss, you tell yourself, it could be worse. And when you drive home and you pull into the driveway and you look at the house and all the things that you need to do around it and all the things that you're responsible for, it could be worse. And when you step out of the shower and you look in the mirror, (laughs) it could be worse. And when you roll over in the morning and you look at your spouse, (laughs) you might just not want to say it in that moment, but it could be worse. Paul amazes me. Silas amazes me. In the middle of pain, in the darkest of moments, literally at midnight, what do we find them doing? Worshiping God. Oh, it's a powerful thing. What Paul and Silas knew was the profound and powerful role and impact that worship has in our life. And every single week we gather, I'm always praying, God, would you... Introduce someone to the power of praise and the power of worship and how when we declare the goodness of who you are and remind our soul of the reality of your love and faithfulness in our life, what does it do to our posture and our perspective as we continue to follow you in and through this life? That's what worship is. Worship is reminding your soul of who your God is. That ultimately, that's the goal of theology, you know, we gather every single week and around here we're Bible geeks and that's a beautiful thing. And, but here's the deal. The goal of theology is not knowledge. The goal of theology is worship. The more you understand who your God is, the more you should just express your adoration and devotion and thankfulness to who God is. The scripture says, no matter what you're facing, be a person of prayer and praise. That essentially what separates worry from prayer is worry is processing your problems with yourself. But prayer is processing your problems with God. And and I think prayer and praise are the key to peace, even amidst some of the hardest situations. And it says that they were praising God. Which is a principle that I always put before you, and I think it deserves to be repeated over and over again as we try to live out this life for Christ ourselves, is pressure is more honest than pleasure. That it's easy to be a Christian when things are going well. It's easy to act like a follower of Christ in a space like this. The question is, is how do you act like Christ when you're battling cancer? And what do you do when your job begins to lay people off? And how do you follow Christ when pain comes knocking at the door? It's in those moments that you really shine as a follower of Christ. Because have you ever discovered it's when you start to suffer that people start to pay attention? And it's in those moments that the reality and the substance of who you are and God's work in your life begins to show itself in profound ways. Paul and Silas are in a prison cell, in the middle of pain, and they're worshiping God. And what does scripture say? The other prisoners were listening. A lot of times we don't ever take this into consideration that the world around you, the family members that you're surrounded by, the peers, the, the teammates, the, the other school, uh, uh, students in your school, the coworkers, the neighbors, they're paying attention. 
and they are listening to the message of your life and the declaration of your words. And my question for you is, what would happen if you were to do an audit on your life and consider, what does my life articulate to those around me? Does my life declare faith in God? Does my life declare an unwavering confidence in his goodness? What does my life communicate to those around me? Because here's the thing, folks. Your life may be the only Bible people read. And if that's the case, you might as well live on mission knowing that God's gonna entrust you with influence. And maybe, just maybe, God's gonna do something in and through your life that's going to impact somebody else's. The other prisoners were listening. What's amazing all throughout the Bible, and you see this from cover to cover, this theme or this idea of prison and bondage and captivity, it's over and over again where the people of God are facing trials. You see Joseph falsely accused and thrown into prison. You see the nation of Israel held in captivity in Egypt. You see Daniel in captivity. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in captivity. You see the early disciples, Paul, John, thrown into prison. You even see Jesus arrested. It's an amazing thing. And all throughout it, it's this idea that scripture is teasing out that our God is in the business of setting people free. Our God is in the business of liberating people and breaking the shackles off their hands and feet. And here's the deal, maybe you're not a Christian and you've never been told this, and I say this as gently as I possibly can, and it's meant to be an encouragement, not an insult. But every single one of us was born into the shackles of sin. And if you're not a Christian, you still have shackles upon your life. And the beauty of our God is he comes to every single one of us bound in bondage, every single one of us who was enslaved by sin, and he extends freedom and liberty and breakthrough to every single one of us. And what I love about it is it says that they were, yeah, I love that 17 of you are with me. We're, we're going to get the rest of the room there in a second. It's an amazing thing. They, they were listening. And what does it say? It says there was an earthquake that began to shake the foundations of the prison. And every single week, I, I pray, God, would you just shake the foundations of the prisons that people are in, imprisoned by addiction, imprisoned by bad behaviors and toxic thoughts and habits. God, would you just shake the prisons, imprisoned by bad relationships, God, would you shake the foundations of the prisons that hold people captive and keep them from the true life that you have desired for every single one of us? And so the prison foundations shake, the doors fling wide open, the shackles come off their feet. And in that moment, what happens? The jailer wakes up and he recognizes, oh my goodness, I'm doomed. I was told to guard them carefully. And now they've escaped. And now I'm going to be in trouble. And so what does he think to himself? Well, I'm just going to kill myself because these leaders are malicious and gross and they like to drag out torture. So I might as well do myself a favor and take myself out. And right before he's about to harm himself, Paul shouts, no, don't harm yourself. We are still here. Oh, what a statement. Because most of us, myself included, if the doors fling wide open and the shackles come off our feet, what are we going to do? Run! It's a jailbreak. Everyone for themselves. This is Alcatraz 3.0, right? But Paul had this discernment. Wait a second. In this moment, God's not setting us free. God's about to set this man free. What's amazing is watching so many Christians succumb to fear and timidity that they're always on retreat looking for an escape. And I wonder what would happen if we developed the same type of resolve that Paul and Silas had that says, hey, come what may, I'm standing in the gap for individuals who are going through hardship, bound by lies, enslaved by sin, and I'm standing in the gap reminding them that we're still here and we're for you and God can do in your life what he's done in our life, amen? That's the follower of Christ. We're still here. And this man, he flips on the lights and he says, okay, what must I do to be saved? See, in this moment, this jailer is having the ultimate revelation. 
He's having an epiphany moment because up until this point, he thought he held the keys. As the jailer, he thought, I'm the one with the authority holding the keys. And he starts to discover, oh my goodness, they possess something that I don't have. And clearly there is one greater than I who truly holds the key of life. What do I have to do to experience what you're experiencing? What do I have to do to know and live with confidence that the same God that's on your side will be on my side? And what they say is so simple. Sometimes we overlook the power of simplistic obedience. They just said, believe in Jesus. That's what scripture says. To be saved is to surrender your pride, acknowledge your deficiencies, acknowledge your inability to save yourself, and fully accept God's desire to do the heavy lifting in your life. I believe that this Jesus did for me what I could never do for myself. And so I am going to trust and place my faith in him as he does the heavy lifting in and through my life. And he says, believe in Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. Now, we have to unpack that because that can be misinterpreted. What Paul is not saying is if you give your life to Christ, everyone in your life will also be saved simultaneously. That's bad theology. Our heavenly father is our heavenly father. And what you need to know about our heavenly father is he doesn't have grandchildren. There is no carpool lane to heaven where one person has to drive and everyone else gets to freeload. No, at some point, we all have to place our faith in Jesus Christ and receive him as heavenly father. And Paul says, you and your entire household will be saved. Well, what is he saying? Paul is making a statement of confidence. He, what he is talking about is the sufficiency of Christ. He's saying, listen, in the same way God redeemed my life and in the same way God saved me, he can save you and he can save your bride and he can save your kids and he can save your in-laws and your parents and your wild cousins and your crazy uncles because his grace is sufficient for all of us. That salvation is available to every single one of us. And just know, if you're not a Christian, salvation stands ready and available to every single one of us, despite who you are, despite where you've been, despite what you've done, because it's not about how bad you are. It's about how good Christ is that tips the scales in our favor. It's outstanding. And the other thing that Paul is saying is Paul saying, sir, listen here. If you fully surrender your life to Christ, and, and fellas, just, just lean in on this because this is what Paul's trying to get across to this man. He's saying, if you fully surrender your life to Christ, God will not only redeem your life in such a profound way that leaves you astonished, but your wife will be astonished and your kids will be astonished and the family who knows you the best will take notice and eventually you will be the greatest proof. Wait a second. What is God doing in dad's life? What is God doing in my husband's life? What is God doing in the life of the leader of our home? And he's saying, what God will do in your life will come with such convincing evidence that eventually, not immediately, but gradually over time, God will gain credibility in your home because of his work in your life. It's amazing. So they believed, and it says, and they were baptized. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. We are going public in our faith. Now, I, I love studying the Greek and the Hebrew, and I don't think you need to overdo it in a way that causes you to not trust the reliability of your English translation. But I do think in terms of doing a deeper dive and just you know, edifying your faith and expanding your understanding, it's, it's fun to do a good word study. And the word baptized that Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, uses in that moment is really fascinating. Obviously, it means to immerse or submerge, but the, the actual definition means to be completely whelmed. Think about that. The, the word that he uses, the exact and initial definition is to be completely whelmed. In other words, individuals who go public in their faith, 
Individuals who go into the waters of baptism. Individuals who are immersed and submerged, identifying with the death and the resurrection of Christ. Are individuals who have been overwhelmed by his grace. Overwhelmed by his goodness. Overwhelmed by his faithfulness. Overwhelmed by his redemption and his creativity and his willingness to walk alongside broken roads and to redeem our lives. You ever been overwhelmed by grace? That for whatever reason, this God steps into our shoes and takes the hit, absorbs the wrath of God and redeems us for all of eternity. That he loves all of us as if there was only one of us. That the one who knows you the best loves you the most. If you're not overwhelmed by it, you don't understand it. You don't understand how radically in love God is for you. And some of you, you've been painted this picture. You've been given a caricature of God. That he's always angry and ready to smite you. God's not mad at you. God is mad about you. And when you discover his unyielding and overwhelming love for you, that every single day, despite your brokenness and despite your shortcomings, you wake up with a truckload of grace dumped upon your life. And then the next day, a truckload of grace dumped upon your life. And then the next day, a truckload of grace dumped upon your life. And what eventually begins to happen is you discover his grace is inexhaustible. That you cannot exhaust his grace. You might as well throw in the towel because your sin is no match for God's grace. And I love what the old theologians would say. They would refer to Christ as the hound of heaven. Just constantly pursuing and chasing us down with his love.